Welcome to the evening service of Hebron Evangelical Church, Dowlice. We'll open our service with prayer. Father God, we thank you um, that you chose people before the foundation of the world. Uh, you set your love upon men and women to save them and to make them holy and blameless. Uh, we ask that we might know uh, those eternal plans uh, being worked out in our lives uh, according to your great grace and mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I will sing a hymn. Uh, the words will be on the screen, but if you have a hymn book, uh, it's number 490 in the white books and 494 in the red books. Father, t'was thy love that knew us, earth's foundations long before. Turning to the book of Romans in a moment, but we'll read from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and so this is a passage we're familiar with uh, from Tuesday evenings, but I'll read again Ephesians 1 and verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, 
making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And we'll turn to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you tonight um, that if we are Christians, it is because of your great mercy to us. It is because uh, you knew us before the world was made and in love uh, you drew us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, forgive us for pride and self-righteousness. Uh, when these things are present in our lives, we ask that we would uh, flee from them, knowing that we are only saved because of your love and your gracious purpose to us. Uh, we have only come to Christ, if we have, because of your sovereign purpose in our lives. Uh, and so we thank you. Uh, if we are in Christ, we thank you for drawing us and bringing us to life uh, and giving us sight to see our sin uh, and to see Christ and for giving us faith. We ask as we come to your word again this evening, we ask that we might be strengthened as we consider uh, that just as your love first drew us, uh, so it is your love will keep us and will bring us safe to glory. Uh, so keep us, we pray, uh, by the truth of your word. Forgive us uh, all of our sin. Uh, we confess uh, that we often get things wrong. Uh, we make unwise decisions and choices, um, but we've also seen, uh, as we've gone through Ecclesiastes, your word tells us um, that, yes, sometimes we might lack the wisdom we need, but also uh, we confess our decisions on times are more than just mistakes and bad choices. Our decisions, too, are willful rebellion. Uh, we do wrong, and uh, we do wrong even when we, we know what we do is wrong, uh, and yet we continue in the course we have chosen. And so we ask that you would forgive us, uh, may we turn from sin, and may we cling to Christ. Uh, may our refuge in him uh, be clear to us this evening. Uh, may we know what it is to look away from ourselves and find all that we need in Christ. May we go on and live lives of, of love and joy and peace uh, and uh, all of these things, lives of, of service, lives that bring you glory. Uh, bless us and we pray. Watch over us as a congregation. Uh, be with those who are sick and unwell at the present time. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing again. Uh, if you have a white book at home, it's number 489. In the red books, it's 493. Far beyond time, beyond creation's dawn, before the sun and moon and stars were born, salvation's way for sinners lost undone was counselled forth by God, the three in one.
morning that last week uh, I started reading the novel The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, in 1954, a sequel to The Hobbit was published, a trilogy of books called The Lord of the Rings. Apparently, when Tolkien wrote those books, this is how he went about it. He said, I started with a map and made the story fit. He started by creating a world and by drawing that world out as a map. It was a world of, of different peoples and languages and regions and geographies and, and histories. In fact, he drew many maps and those maps shaped the story he wrote. He ensured that the, the journeys his characters took in the book matched the dimensions of the map he drew. Now the point is this, uh, Tolkien didn't just sit down and write. He only got down to writing after he first planned and drew out the world of his story. Now this morning uh, we returned to Paul's epistle to the Romans and we returned to where we left off in verse 28. And Romans 8 verse 28 assures God's people that, uh, so look at verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good for Christians, uh, for those described here as those who love God. All things work together for them because they are part of God's purpose. What is God's purpose? Well, it's outlined in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's purpose is to bring all of his people to glory, to be with his Son, the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. God's people will be with Jesus. They will behold his majesty, but they will also share in his glory. They will be conformed to his image. And so this morning we said, how certain a prospect is that? The answer we said is, it's very certain. It is certainly certain. It is impossible for things to be otherwise. It is certain because God has a plan. And in these verses here, as we go from verse 29 to 30, we see the stages of God's plan outlined for us by the Apostle Paul. There are five words that Paul uses and uh, five words that I want us to consider in verses 29 and 30. So look at verses 29 and 30 again. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, so foreknew, uh, we looked at that this morning. Predestined, uh, that's what I want us to consider this evening. And then we'll move on and look at called, justified and glorified. So this morning we looked at how Christians are those whom God foreknew. Uh, we said that word, uh, as it's used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's a word that speaks of more than just knowing something before it happens. Uh, we said it's an intimate word, to know someone. Uh, we said it has the sense of God setting his love upon his people. And because he has set his love upon them, he is going to do something for them. Uh, and so foreknew is closely connected to this word that we have this evening. It's closely connected to this word predestined. Predestined means to decide beforehand. Uh, there's a verse in Acts chapter 4 uh, that describes how God decides events before they happen. Uh, so in Acts chapter 4 
uh, Peter and John were facing opposition in Jerusalem and they cried out in prayer to God. Uh, they considered that they were being opposed. But those opposing them had before opposed Jesus. And so that is part of their consideration. That is, in their minds, we are being opposed, but these people oppose Christ before us. And so in their prayer, we read this. Acts chapter 4, verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. And so all of these people, Peter and John are saying, we remember they were set against the Holy Lord Jesus Christ. But then comes verse 28, they were set against him to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, the things that had happened in Jerusalem to Jesus were the things that God in his plan had predestined to take place. And that's what this word predestined means, to decide upon beforehand. Now, God is in control. He determines events. He decides beforehand. And so do you see the link and the progression between these two words? Because God has foreknown or foreloved his people, because he has set his heart upon them, that means he is going to decide things for them. He has a plan for his people. A Tolkien drew out his maps and then sat down to write his story. He knew where he was going with it. Well, God has planned things out for his people. Before the story, as it were, before the story began, his plan was drawn. His love was already set upon his people. And so he drew out their stories. Uh, he decided things in advance for them. I mentioned this on Tuesday night. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he preached on Romans 8, verse 29, when he came to this word predestined, he considered the Greek origin of the word used by the Apostle Paul. And he pointed out that the Greek word is a compound word. So it's comprised of two Greek words. The first part of the word means beforehand, like the pre in predestined. The second half of the word, though, is where we get our English word horizon from. And so the idea is God's people have come into his horizon. He's left them in advance. And for that reason, they are in his horizon. They are in his view. They are in his horizon where now, in his love, he is going to do things for them. And now Martin Lloyd-Jones described what a horizon is. Uh, when I was a, a student in Aberystwyth, I had a lovely room with a view. And uh, it looked out at the sea. And you could see the horizon. And so the horizon, the, the line between the sea and the sky. Uh, but what is it? Well, it's the extent, the horizon is the extent of how far you can see. It's the limit of how far you can see. There are all the things in my sight. There are all the things I can see. And there is everything else beyond and over the horizon. To be predestined means God's people are in his view. They are in his sight, in the sense that they are the people that God has set apart to bless and to save and to bring, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and to be made like him. They are the ones that he has brought within his horizon. They are in the sight of his love. Now, if you are a Christian, isn't this humbling? Isn't this overwhelming? Why are you a Christian? And why is the end of your salvation certain? 
that you will know Christ in his glory and you will be conformed to that glory yourself. Why is that the case? Well, it's not the case because of anything in you. It is because you have been loved in advance by him and he has drawn out and worked out and carried out his purpose for you. On Tuesdays, we've been in Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, I read it a moment ago. Uh, why am I in God's horizon? Uh, well, Ephesians 1 verse 5 says this, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to to the purpose of his will. Uh, verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 1, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. If you are a Christian, it is because God's plan, uh, the plan made in eternity before the foundation of the world, you are a Christian because his will or plan or purpose has been brought to pass. Uh, there was no hope in yourself. You were without God in the world. You were blind and deaf and dead. God's love in eternity past means that God has set in motion a purpose for all of his people that will bring them to a destination that now is beyond our conception. Uh, perhaps you feel uh, you have a long way to go in the Christian life. Uh, perhaps you are feeling that you are a failure as a Christian. You are not what you should be. You are not what you want to be. Well, this evening, uh, fill your mind with how God describes his people. Uh, listen to these verses in the Old Testament uh, that describe God's love for Israel. Uh, so Exodus chapter 19, uh, God said to Moses, um, to the people of Israel, uh, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5 goes on. You shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, uh, 23 and 24, we read this. And who is like your people Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people uh, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. Uh, we read from Deuteronomy 7 this morning. So again, let me remind you of these words. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The people of Israel were God's treasured possession. And that was seen in all that God brought about for them. He delivered them from slavery in Egypt so that they would be his people forever. Now, it is the same for all of God's people. Uh, God's love for you is seen in what he has done. Uh, remember these words from back in Romans chapter 5. So Romans 5 verse 8. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. You might feel you are not what you want to be. Or it might be that you're, you're just feeling battered and bruised. Perhaps you're down for that reason. You've been hurt by other people. Well, think upon this. You are the treasured possession of God himself. If you've seen your sin and you've gone to refuge in Jesus Christ, your trust in him as your saviour, know this. You have called out to him only because he first called out to you. Only because he loved you before the world was ever made and he made a plan. A plan where he would give his son for your sin and the son of course willingly took up the charge to do that. You are a Christian because of that plan made for you. And also every other detail was planned. Uh, the people you met, the situations you were in, the sermons you heard, the person who brought you to church, the verses of scripture that spoke to you, all planned by God to bring you to himself to be his treasured possession. Now, if all of that has happened, how can you doubt God's future for you? Uh, he is already a plan. He is, he's already planned uh, the way that you will go to glory. Are you in humble awe and wonder and adoration at the God of all grace? I deserve only condemnation and yet I have been given all of this. Now of course there are difficulties with our understanding all of this. There are things about this that we can't understand. If you're a Christian how is that so? Well because we have been drawn by that eternal plan of God to himself. Uh, Jesus said in John's Gospel, John 6 verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Uh, so without God drawing a person to Christ, it is impossible for anyone to ever come to faith in Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ also said this, John chapter 5 and verse 40, to those rejecting him, he said, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. A person only comes to Christ if they are drawn by God. But it's also true that a person who does not go to Christ does not go to Christ because they've refused to do so. And they are responsible for their unbelief. Now, how can both of those things be true? I don't know, uh, but both are found in the word of God. Uh, there are some people who try to give a different interpretation of the word predestination. Uh, there are those who say predestination is simply the plans God has for those he knows. Uh, because he knows everything, um, predestination is the plans God has for those he knows will respond to the gospel. Now, I don't want to spend time on that, but simply look at these verses again. And notice in these verses, they clearly describe what God does. And so we read, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Every bit of our salvation is God's sovereign work. Uh, one of the commentators quotes uh, the late J.I. Packer, who died about a month ago. They quote uh, from a book he wrote in the early 1960s called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. And in the little book, Packer argued that every Christian no matter what they might say in a theological debate, every Christian believes the interpretation of predestination being God foreordaining those who are saved. He wrote this, In the first place, you give God 
thanks for your conversion. Now, why do you do that? Because you know in your heart that God was entirely responsible for it. You did not save yourself. He saved you. There is a second way in which you acknowledge that God is sovereign in salvation. You pray for the conversion of others. You ask God to work in them everything necessary for their salvation. And so Packer argued those two things we do as Christians prove that we believe this doctrine here. I struggled with these truths when I first became a Christian. Uh, but then one Sunday morning, uh, the truth of it all overwhelmed me. In the singing uh, of a hymn, I'll, I'll put on the screen in a moment, uh, the hymn, uh, Sovereign Grace or Sin Abounding. And the last verse of that hymn says, On such love my soul still ponder, love so great, so rich and free. Say while lost in holy wonder, why, O Lord, such love to me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, grace shall reign eternally. Uh, there are mysteries and depths in God's word that we will never plumb. Uh, but the greatest mystery is why he should love a sinner like me at all. I've given you these words of John Newton before. Although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great saviour. We'll sing that hymn. If you have a red book at home, it's number 501. In the white books, it's 504. Sovereign grace or sin abounding. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.